Welcome friends to another r slash nuclear revenge video. Today we've got a crazy story of revenge against a coworker. Our story of the day is I took revenge on a colleague. Working in a kitchen is a fast paced, intense environment. So when I moved to London and started chefing in a restaurant, I found myself feeling overwhelmed. I didn't think I'd last. It was a big kitchen, meaning a hive of activity. On that first day, the head chef spent half of his time shouting at me and, well, I wasn't exactly a firecracker, so it was hard to hear. Not that he didn't have a good reason. I stuffed up an order, dropped a hot pan, and nearly tripped him up. The ray of hope in the sweltering cage was a sous chef called Jess. She was a lovely girl. Gentle, kind, and very gracious. Also very tall. She gave me two pieces of solid advice on that first day. Clean as you go and make others aware when you're passing them. They served me well. I have to admit to feeling miserable in those first few weeks. I didn't know anyone, I wasn't very confident, and I'd thrown myself into a demanding job with long hours. I thought about jacking it all in and running off to Canvey Island. I didn't know what I'd do there, or even if there was anything to do there, but anything seemed better than drowning in loneliness and hot fat. It was Jess that actually pulled me through the breaking in period. She offered to go for a drink with me. I cheerfully accepted, grateful for not having to go straight back to my pokey flat for once. And we went to a place called the Dog and Duck. Nice pub. Had all the things you want from your quiet evening pint. Sticky carpets, a flirty landlady the wrong side of 65, and atop it off, some skinheads. I tried to relax, but I couldn't. I just tried my best to keep a low profile. Jess, sweet and kind Jess, seemed to have other ideas though. She was a punk. I thought that died with Sid Vicious, but nope. In purple eye shadow and as bold as brass, it was sitting opposite me. I was never very clued in when it came to pop culture. Punk Jess was more relaxed, bolder and louder than Chef Jess. At first, I didn't know what to make of it, but in time I grew very fond of this side of her. She had a wicked sense of humor and was a great storyteller. Her family had to move a lot growing up, so she grew up all over the world, which gave her lots of interesting stories to tell. I asked why she became a punk. I remember her answer as clear as crystal, well, the gist of it anyway. I might have to paraphrase bits. I've lived among Indians, Mexicans, and South Africans. I've seen the cruelty and hardship facing the Dalits, lived in the shadows, lived in the shadow of the Talatalalka massacre, and lived on the outskirts of the civil unrest in South Africa. You know what I noticed? There were always patterns. In each country, you had decent people scraping by, powerful figures abusing their situation, and the wrestle between them for their country's futures. It made me think that no matter where you go, you'll always find these qualities. The stuff that makes us human, the stuff that unites us all. So if you think I'll just sit here and let the skinheads tear us apart, you've got another thing coming. That's why I'm a punk to make a statement. Well, she certainly did that. After she'd finished giving me the full Marx treatment, two skinheads strutted over to us. Jesus, I thought. I hope I won't have to fight. I grew up in Pangborn, not Chicago. They'd obviously heard her and were gunning for an argument or worse. I wanted the ground to swallow me up. But Jess was feeling a lot braver. Goat her though they did. Take the mick though they tried. She rang rings around them. Her blood was evidently up as she invited them outside. They laughed and then looked at me. You just going to sit there? Let your girlfriend do all the work? Before I got a chance to say anything though, she got up and said, Right, outside. Or are your balls smaller than your you-know-whats? That got a few laughs. Not that she paid any attention, she was right out that door. The lads glanced at me before going outside, and I could feel some other pairs of eyes watching me. I was sitting there, bricking it. I decided I couldn't just sit here. If she was going to get beaten up, I may as well join her. Legs like jelly, I walked out into the chilly air and all three of them looked at me. I said, look, we don't want any trouble, just leave us be. Maybe we don't want to, was their response. Maybe we should give you bleeding hearts liberals a good hiding, show you what real life is all about. I said, you jerks couldn't give Wilfred Bramble a good hiding. My first thought was, what on earth am I saying? I might even have blushed a little, though that could just be my memory playing tricks. They smiled. I didn't know whether or not that was a good thing. Turns out it wasn't. The chubbier of the two get up in my face and says he's going to fix my attitude. A scuffle ensued. Me and him were grabbing onto each other, and I was so hyper-focused that I didn't notice that Jess 
had swiftly been dealing with the other one before coming up to mine from behind and putting him in a blood choke. He initially tried to let go, but I grabbed his arms and kept him in place. After a few moments, he went down. She invited me back to her place for a nightcap, like we just had some kind of date. It would have been one heck of a wild date where she served hot chocolate with a tot of rum. Considering her punkish nature, her home was surprisingly floral. Her first question when she sat down was, so who's Wilfred Bramble? I told her that he was an actor. Throughout those couple of hours, I discovered that domestic Jess was the bridge between Chef Jess and Punk Jess. She was attentive and kind, yet still quite forthright. I wasn't used to women like that, so it was a bit jarring at first, but I grew to appreciate her over time. One person who evidently felt nothing but rancor for Jess was one of the waiters, Steve. A few times when I was close enough, I heard him whisper a nasty name when she was in earshot. The meanings were lost on me, as I said. I wasn't exactly au fait when it came to the issues and culture of the wider world. For this, I can blame my upbringing. My parents were strict Baptists, the kind that took the Bible at its word, leading colorless, rigid lives. A generous person would dub them orthodox. I'd call them extremists. My father beat the good book into my skull and my mother watched on, looking dopey, apparently under the impression that divine work was being done. Looking back, wrath seemed to be my father's only emotion. I never saw him smile, laugh, or anything. If he wasn't angry, he was just stone cold. As I got older, the animalistic, primitive duality of his emotions fostered resentment. You know, I did try to have a life outside our drab, chintzy Victorian home. After school, I'd sometimes slip into the newsagents and allow myself to be beckoned to the colorful, glamorous magazines. Cassidy, My Heartbreak is one that sticks in my mind for some reason. Another one was a picture of Scylla Black. I know exactly why I remember that. I even tried to make a few friends. Most at school didn't want to know the weird kid. But there was this lovely chubby lad named Jimmy who was brave enough to attempt it. Unfortunately, we were only pals for a couple of weeks. The school bullies harassed him about it mercilessly, even throwing stones at him. Some children are vile, aren't they? I never quite got past that. Is it bad that, even after all these years, I still occasionally dream of throttling them? You don't always need to understand a word to know the intent, do you? I picked up on the mean-spiritedness when he said words like, Dyke. It took the benefit of hindsight for me to see his ignorance. He was barking up the wrong tree apparently unaware of the major distinction. Not that I could have criticized, as I wasn't much better. One evening after work, I caught Jess alone, smoking a cigarette round the back. I asked her, what's the problem between you and Steve? There was a silent pause. You could tell that she was considering her answer carefully, before answering, Steve doesn't approve of my life. Me, foolish me, replied heedlessly with, oh, you mean being a punk? She looked at me and smiled before turning away for a puff. She was very kindly trying not to look too amused, but you could tell she was suppressing a laugh. I gently tried pursuing the subject further, but it was clear she didn't want to talk about it. What she did was offer to go on a proper date with me. I thought, why not? I think she's great, so even if it doesn't work out, it'll be fun and I'll gain some much needed dating experience. I briefly had a hot flash when I realized she might suggest a punk concert, but to my surprise, her suggestion was as far from that as possible. It was a Saturday afternoon when I met her at Kew Gardens. As we strolled around, it became clear she was in her element. She could tell me something about most of the plants there and did so with zeal. She confessed to me that, yes, she did love gardening. Having a few plants to nurture gave her a sense of constancy in her life when growing up. No matter where or how she was moving around, there were always plants. Jubea chilensis, she suddenly interjected at one point. I say, bless you. The palm tree, she smiled. Did you know they cut them down for their sap? They use it to make wine. I smiled. I tried to take an interest, but I couldn't muster the same level of enthusiasm as her. Never the fool, she saw through my feigned wonder and offered to go for a coffee afterwards. She promised not to talk plants. I smiled again. We went to a quiet little cafe and got to know each other more intimately. I told her about my past and, oddly, it was a point of bonding. It wasn't parents in her case though, but her ex who had been sporadically violent. She said she'd convinced herself that it was a blip the first time. He promised never to do it again. Told her that he loved her. 
except he did a number of times, recycling his worn-out promise each time. Eventually, she one day packed her things whilst he was at work and did a bunk, not so much as looking back. She asked me what the most rebellious thing I've ever done was. I told her about the news agents. Get you, she laughed. I'm surprised you didn't make the papers. Yeah, yeah, I said, very droll. I always enjoyed being with her, and I was beginning to enjoy it more and more. Not even a lecture on plants could slow the momentum. You know what I really loved? She was easy to be with. I felt like I could come out of my shell and just relax, be myself. After we'd finished our coffees, we parted ways and I went home feeling quite serene. On top of the world even. At last, my life felt like it was accounting to something fulfilling. Wait, I actually had a life. We had a second date at the ABC on Edgware Road. We went to see E.T. Just found the alien utterly unconvincing, like a geriatric sloth to use her phrasing, but I quite enjoyed. Whether that makes me sad, I'll leave that for you good people to decide. After the film finished, we headed back to hers with a Chinese, we kicked back and had a good laugh, and then at the end of it all I kissed her on the cheek and left. The next morning, my first thought was of her. I wondered if there'd be a third date, I was hopeful, and if so, what'd we do next time? In the interim, it was business as usual. A couple of days afterward, I overheard Steve talking to Jess. They were out back on their break, but I couldn't properly hear what was being said for the clattering. I did hear him tell her that her kind shouldn't be around normal people. I was in half a mind to go out there and tell him to back off, but I didn't get the chance. She promptly came back inside and rolled her eyes. I asked if she was okay, and she just smiled and nodded. As it happened, I ran into Steve at Safeway one Saturday. I noticed he was wearing a strange necklace. It was strange in that it had an odd symbol on the pendant, one which I didn't at all recognize. It was many years later before I discovered it was called a wolf's hook. He started off quite amiable, but it was obvious that he was itching to talk about Jess. As soon as we got past the formalities, he hit me with a striking question. Why do you knock about with it? I did a double take. It? I asked, and he nodded casually, as if referring to someone like that was at all normal. I said, if you mean Jess, then it's because she's a nice girl. He scoffed and instantly went down the conspiracy rabbit hole. That's how they get you. They're all nice and sweet at first, but it's just an act. It's manipulation. They just want to poison your mind and turn you into one of them. I tried to take him seriously, but A, he was starting to come off a bit loopy, and B, I had no clue what he was talking about. For the third date, Jess invited me around hers for dinner. She asked me if that was alright. I said, of course, I know you're not a bad cook. And she smiled wryly. Only briefly though, as there was a slight sense of nerves about her. She said there was something important we had to discuss. Ominous, I thought. As time passed, I began to think it wasn't going to be a date at all. I became convinced that she was setting up an occasion to let me down gently. As it turned out, it was something else entirely. We were about halfway through the main course when Jess broached the big taboo. She confessed to me that she was transgender. I had her repeat herself because I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I felt like I'd just entered a parallel universe. I felt cheated and confused. She said that she thought we were getting on so well that there was no reason to spoil it. In this emotional haze, I shouted at her. I called her a liar and a fraud. She cried and I walked out. As I walked home, I began to feel like my father. That despite my best efforts to shake off his puritanism, maybe some had rubbed off on me. The anger and confusion eased and I decided to go back. She could have handled her side of things better, but I could have handled mine better too. I would apologize for losing my temper, for shouting at her. I could only hope she would accept it. It was no short walk back either. I was already three-fourths of the way home when I decided to turn back, so it took me the better part of 45 minutes before I got there. When I got up to her flat's floor, my blood ran cold. The door was open. I hurried inside, through the hall and into the living room. I felt unutterably sick. She was still, draped over the sofa. Her face and arms badly bruised, bottoms removed, any trace of dignity had been ripped from her. I went over cautiously and grabbed her wrist. There was still a pulse. I dashed over to her phone and called an ambulance. Whilst I waited, I took off my jacket and covered her. I tried to talk to her, seek out a scrap of consciousness, but to no avail. 
It was only when the ambulance arrived and took her that I noticed under where her hand had been, there was something shiny. I did a double take because I recognized what it was instantly. The pendant from Steve's necklace. When the time to talk to the police had arrived, I told them I could identify the pendant and subsequently who'd attacked her. I told them everything, all about his weird, nasty obsession with her, about all the names he called her, harassing her at work and our conversation in safe ways. I was confident that it would be enough to see justice done. And so I waited, and I waited some more. I still saw Steve at work. Had he even been questioned? And I noticed that he looked quite smug. It was definitely him. I wanted to punch his lights out. A few days after the incident, I went up to the hospital to see Jess. Her situation was dire. She was on life support and her injuries were awful. It seemed that she'd been repeatedly hit with a blunt instrument and the particularly bad injuries to her arms were the result of her trying to shield herself. Learning all of this, I found myself shaking. It was one of those moments where you knew you were about to be hit by a wave of emotion much too strong to comprehend. To temper the mounting anger, I reminded myself that the police would get him. It was on the following Friday that near the end of my shift, I saw the police come in and cart Steve away. I felt some sense of relief. It was fairly short-lived though as on the Monday, he waltzed right back into work like nothing had happened. Straight after work, I stormed over to the station and asked them why they let such a violent criminal free. They said they didn't have enough to hold him, nothing concrete. I told them I recognized his necklace, but they said it could have been anyone's. They found only one set of prints on it, and they weren't his. They assured me that they were still investigating though and that I should come back if I remember anything else. It was a couple of days later when I went to visit Jess again, except when I got there, I found her bed empty. As soon as the nurse walked by, I asked how long she'd been up and about. The look in the nurse's eyes told me that my optimism had been misplaced. She had passed a few days ago. To be honest, I didn't really take it in at first. It just seemed to wash over me. I asked where she was. Funeral directors had taken her. Her parents had already been and had gotten the arrangements in motion. I knew I wouldn't get anything specific from her, but I asked about the parents anyway in some vain hope. But predictably, she told me that she couldn't pass on any personal details. As soon as I got home, I grabbed the phone book and started searching people with her surname. I found a few dozen numbers and called nearly half of them before finally finding them. I introduced myself to them as a friend and colleague and, after some discussion, was asked by her father if I might want to attend the funeral. It took place the following week. They told me where to find the chapel of rest, but I couldn't bring myself to go. But in the end, I wish I hadn't gone to the funeral either. Her mother, the less open-minded of her parents, had insisted on having the funeral for Martin, which I now know is what's called the dead name. I didn't know the term at the time. However, I could still sense that this was a disrespectful act. When I got the funeral program, she'd had that name printed onto it as well as a picture of him. I wanted to say something but ultimately I was just a guest and I wasn't going to achieve anything by upsetting her mother. No doubt I would have been kicked out and that would have been that. I decided that I'd do something of my own to honor my memory. I went to a florist's and bought a dozen pink carnations and then I went home and made a sort of card. On the front I wrote her name and did a poor sketch of her. On the inside I scribbled down some of the happier moments in our relatively brief friendship and wrote a little poem. Then when it was getting late, I took the card and flowers along with a small trowel to the nearest woods. I buried the card and laid the flowers on top of it and then just sat and reminisced for a while. One thing clearly occupied my thoughts there and on the way home. That last evening, for as long as I live, I'll regret how I handled it. Well, I was determined to at least try and set the world's order right, to balance the scales. At first, I clung on to the hope that the law would see her right, that they'd find something or a witness that could pin it to him. As more time passed, though, it became increasingly clear that Steve was going to escape their clutches. The very thought incensed me. You couldn't imagine what it was like having to work around the scum. At one point, he even slapped me on the back and asked me how I was doing. I wanted to grab the hot frying pan and swing it straight at him. That's when it occurred to me that I could do something about it. 
The kitchen was a hazardous place. Late in my shift, when nobody was looking, I splashed some oil by my foot a little while before Steve was due to come round and then just waited. When I heard him coming, I grabbed my knife and started chopping an onion, and then, just as he was moving behind me, I pretended to step back and slip on the oil, falling with the tool in hand, splashing his arm as I went. It was a deep cut, and as soon as he noticed, he wailed like a newborn. Externally, I pretended to be horrified, but on the inside, I felt some kind of euphoria. You might call it sick, but if you were in my shoes, God forbid, you'd understand. I got up and set the tool aside. The head chef hurried over to him and placed a towel over the wound whilst the porter phoned for an ambulance. I wanted to enjoy his suffering, but I couldn't. The only thing standing between me and a prison cell was my response to the situation. Any sign of even indifference would raise suspicion. No, this had to look like a terrible accident. Steve started to lose consciousness just as the ambulance arrived. They took him away and told me that I should get checked over just in case. I fell on hard tiles after all, before whisking him away. Truth be told, I did have a very sore elbow, but I didn't bother getting looked over. I was given the day off. It was only when I went back to work that I discovered Steve had passed in the ambulance. I like to think I did a good acting turn. The others were certainly convinced quick to reassure me that it wasn't my fault. Accidents are a workplace hazard. Sadly, they sometimes end up being life-changing or fatal, was what the head chef said. He remarked on the fact that had Steve properly mopped up, it would have never have come to this. Those words were music to my ears. It was like confirmation that I'd gotten away with it. It's been 40 years since Jess's passing, and not a day goes by when I don't think of her. She deserved better than the horrific closing chapter given to her, and I'll always carry the guilt of being a small part of that. I can only hope that when we meet again, if we meet again, she'll think that justice has been done. If there's anything I can take from it all, it's the good memories and the lesson to try and go to bed leaving the world a little kinder than when you woke up. So, first of all, that story was absolutely way more than I thought anybody would ever reasonably share on a nuclear revenge story. I'm just left wondering how you could ever possibly move on from that, knowing that as soon as you walked away, that happened, and the what if, if you didn't leave. Do you think that thought is the kind of thought that would stick in your mind every single day for the rest of your life? I don't know if I would go a day without thinking about it. Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another absolutely crazy revenge story, click on that left video. Or if you missed my latest video, check out the one on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.